I'm Dana Perino, and this is Perino on Politics. The rules are the rules. No props, muted mics. On June 27th in Atlanta, Georgia, President Biden and former President Trump will share the stage at the first 2024 presidential debate after a shared agreement to abide by the rules. However, a civilized discussion remains to be seen. Welcome to Perino on Politics, where we give you everything you need to know from a 30,000 foot view of this week in politics. I'm Jackie Heinrich. I'm guest hosting for Dana Perino. And joining me this week is Fox News contributor and political editor for townhall.com, Guy Benson. Hey, Guy. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. You know, you guys can also hear more of Guy's commentary here on Fox Talk Radio, where he hosts the Guy Benson Show weekdays from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern. One of my favorite listens, actually. And so I'm really happy to have you talking to us today for a look ahead, because we just got these rules over the weekend, Guy, looking ahead to the debate. And I think that one of the more interesting things that we're seeing is that Biden and Trump are going to have their mics muted as they're doing this 90 minute discussion Uh, They'll be seated at a a podium, each of them, their positions determined by a coin flip, no studio audience. But the fact that they're going to have their mics muted, I wonder how that's going to play out, because you know that Trump is going to speak over Biden and maybe we won't be able to hear it on television with their mics muted, but they'll be able to hear each other. So how do you think that's going to play out, Guy? And what does Biden need to do? Because I feel like he's the one who's going to be I guess, more scrutinized for for his performance being the incumbent. Yeah. So a couple things. First, on the muted microphones, my understanding was this was one of the demands of the Biden team because uh, Trump interrupted constantly. We remember that first debate, first of two in 2020, with our former colleague Chris Wallace moderating, and it just devolved into kind of chaos with so much of the shouting and the disruptions coming from the then president, Donald Trump. And Biden's team didn't want that. So they were basically saying, all right, when it's not someone's time to speak, the mic is off. And the thing about that is I almost wonder, because I've seen a lot of Trump supporters sort of mocking this or saying that this is obviously designed to help Joe Biden. I don't know. Look, anything can happen. I'm not going to make any wild predictions. I just want to put out there the very real possibility that that could help Trump because it would force some discipline upon him in terms of what the audience can see or hear. And I think it actually, for the most part, behooves Trump for the American people to listen to Joe Biden uninterrupted trying to answer questions over the course of two hours. Because if Trump can jump in all the time and maybe even inadvertently bail Biden out rather than letting Biden either ramble through his time or sort of potentially maybe cut it short and and looking awkward, I think the mic being off during Biden's time puts the entire spotlight on him, has the baton firmly in his hand to be judged on what he's able to do or not do, and just shuts down the possibility of Trump engaging in some of the histrionics that I think really hurt him in 2020 in that first debate. So that's the first part of your question. And look, it could go either way. I could be wrong, but I think that there is a theory of the case that this actually benefits Trump and puts more pressure on Biden. As for the overall expectations, I do think that there will be increased scrutiny on Biden because Look, 70 to 80 percent of the country doesn't believe that he is fit to continue to serve, let alone for another four years. That's a bipartisan, large consensus among the American electorate based on virtually all of the polling. And so I have been saying now for quite some time, I said it weeks and weeks ago on Outnumbered, I think Republicans make a mistake when they set the bar on the floor for Biden, where if he's able to walk out to the podium, stand there and be fairly coherent over the course of the program, it beats the expectations that are set of like, oh, he's going to come out and, you know, stumble and freeze up and drool on himself and not be able to do the thing because he's too senile. I think when that's the expectation you're setting, anything better than that is a win for Biden. So I think the expectation ought to be for the president of the United States, he has to convince 
more than two thirds of the public who don't believe he has the fitness or acuity to continue as president effectively for the next four and a half years. He has to convince that very large percentage of the country that we are wrong and that he's up for the challenge and he can perform at an extended period of time at a high level. That's the bar that ought to be set. And we'll see if he's able to clear it. And I just can't believe it's already next week. It's so soon. It is so soon. And, you know, just like my observations, because I cover him at the White House. And I think the way that he plays feels a little bit different when you're in the room versus how it comes across on television. Like when he is struggling to read a teleprompter and not delivering his remarks with any emphasis, we know that that's because he sucks reading a teleprompter. It has never been his forte. When you hear him speak off the cuff, it's usually, you know, one of his better performances. That being said, he doesn't take questions often. And we watch him, I think, um, when he's asked a question that he wants to respond to, his advisors really have calculated that there's not a lot of upside for him to engage with the press. They have gained it out and, and measured that their use of the media is much better works in their favor better if they go to select places, talk to friendly people to get their message out only where they really need people to hear that message, not to have it reverberate all over. And so you hear him and you watch him get these questions and sort of stop himself from trying to respond. And it looks like he's glitching if you're watching it on TV. But in in person, it looks like, you know, he is just hearing in the back of his mind, Anita Dunn and all of his other advisors being like, don't do it. Don't do it. So I'm curious to watch how this plays out with Trump because they these men do not like each other. But Biden in particular really blames Trump for everything that happened with Hunter that we just saw play out in court. He believes that the Republicans, you know, forced this to end up in a courtroom. He's now his son's now a convicted felon and he's fiercely protective of his family. And so I think being face to face with someone he has such disdain for is going to be a challenge for him on top of, you know, all of this drilled down messaging that he's always getting, which is keep on, keep on message, stick to the talking points, you know, don't go off the cuff. And I don't think that Trump has any of those parameters. And all he has to do is talk about policy a little bit. And, you know, maybe without, without the uh, benefit of a studio audience that energizes him usually, but I think that the studio audience and these sort of the, the rules that the Biden team asked for, to your point, do benefit Trump more. Because there's maybe less of a chance of the whole thing, you know, flying out of control and Trump flying off the handle. You do wonder, because Biden can get ornery, as you know, he can snap at people when he doesn't like questions. He he gets snippy, right? That's one (laughs) of the things that happens with him. So he could get snippy. You talked about the thing where it looks like you said it kind of looks like he's glitching where he's starting to say something and then he kind of looks down and says, well, never mind, or I shouldn't say he knows that. I, he knows he shouldn't talk about it. Yeah, right. exactly. So I have a slightly different interpretation of that. I think, I think that sometimes you're absolutely right, where the echoes of all of his advisors are sort of bouncing around his head and he wants to say something. He's like, nope, they've warned me about this. I'm not going to do it. I think that is true sometimes. I think there are others, t- other times, and I, I might be wrong about this, but just kind of reading the situation and reading the way that he uses that sometimes I think as a crutch. I think there are other times where he just straight up loses his train of thought. He forgets Mm -hmm. where he is going in a point. And Mm -hmm. rather than completely kind of make it obvious, like, oh, gosh, I forgot what I was saying. He plays it off as like, oh, there's there's something that I want to say that I ought not say. And he kind of uses it maybe for a laugh, given whoever's in the crowd, where it's almost like a like a crutch, almost like a little save where in his mind, he's like, I forget what I was saying. I'm going to pretend that I am showing restraint by not continuing down whatever path it is. Again, I Mm -hmm. might be wrong about that, but I'm just I've seen it enough where I think he uses that that tactic. I think, yeah, I I think I I would agree with you that I've seen that on occasion as well. I think on balance, more often than not, like, remember when he did that Cheshire grin leaving the room Mm -hmm. recently when he, you know, yeah. And he obviously wanted to say something and the alternative, I think, played worse. So it's going to be interesting to see these two together. But you know, 
he seems to be aware of the fact that his age concerns are playing out, you know, including on the world stage, because they opted not to do a solo press conference at the G7 summit. Um, Typically, that's, you know, something that would would happen. And they decided instead to have Zelensky appear alongside him and take, you know, only two questions. And then he sniped at a reporter who asked something that was off topic from the substance of the actual press conference. It was still, you know, another news item. It wasn't about something I think he wouldn't want to answer about Gaza, not Ukraine, which was the topic of the press conference. But still, they really wanted to, like, limit the questions that he got. Mm. And again, I wonder if they are weighing this. And we know that Ron Klain is helping with the debate prep. And they're going to be, you know, focusing on that in uh, the next week or so. And that he's been reported he's going to Camp David to do that. But taking a week for it, I think, really uh, signals something that they're <laughs> they're aware the stakes oh, are pretty yeah. high. Oh, yeah. And I think they're going to probably have him resting a lot. Yes, preparing, but doing a lot of rest leading up to it. They're going to want him as fresh as possible, right? This is two hours prime time at night. I know that people have suggested that maybe there's some sort of uh, cocktail of medication or something that they give him occasionally for big events like the State of the Union. Trump has joked or not joked that he wants a drug test beforehand. That's obviously not going to happen. But I wouldn't be stunned if if some sort of uh, elixir was given to the president. I, I don't think that's a crazy conspiracy theory. Um but I think they want him really as focused as possible, really as rested as possible to then go out there for an enormously high stakes situation. Because, I mean, Jackie, you're aware of this. You're on social media. You talk to a lot of your colleagues. There have been now a series in the last week or so of videos that have gone viral of Mm -hmm. our president in different settings. One was at that Juneteenth celebration with the musical uh, musical performance where he just kind of stood there with a grin, absolutely frozen in place. Um, and then later on, he was like mm-hmm. clapping way, way offbeat with everyone else. And you just look at the video, you're like, all right, that looks a little off, looks a little weird. Then you get the G7 moment where Macron and Maloney seem to be concerned about where he's headed and the direction he's facing. And they very graciously, but I think very clearly go over there to sort of welcome him and nudge him back into the fold over here. Then they kind of, you know, fill in around him for photos and to, you know, hear from the parachuter. That was broken down like the Zapruder film. I mean, everyone was giving their theories of what happened there. And then the Obama moment uh, at the L.A. fundraiser where they got up from their conversation with Jimmy Kimmel and uh, they were basking in the adulation of the crowd and waving and everyone was cheering. And Obama was sort of walking towards the offstage, you know, wings. And he kind of looked back and Biden was just at that point standing there and standing there in such a way that Obama felt obviously compelled or moved to double back and take Biden by the forearm, like grab his forearm and and lead him off stage then and I know in each individual example that I just gave, there's a an interpretation there that's you know totally innocuous. I think taken together, there are people who already have a certain perception of Biden based on what they see of him. Then you see these three moments in the span of a week or two. That's all leading up to this extremely early in the process, high stakes presidential debate. Um, yeah, that there will be a very hot glare of a spotlight on both of these men, but especially the president next week. I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, we should point out that the the White House really went after that video, the skydiving video, the RNC, the New York Post, um, for tweeting it out with cropped frames that you couldn't see that the president was congratulating a skydiver. It looked like he was just wandering off. Um, you know, they they did a whole thing about how, you know, Biden's detractors are now putting out cheap fakes and they went on offense on that. But it's a it's an easy thing for people to look at and not question because 
On the other hand, you've got the picture that Jimmy Kimmel tweeted from that fundraiser and Biden, his face looks like he's melting off. I mean, we, we can admit to ourselves that mm. he looks old. Well, and the other thing he is looks like, older I, than he has. I've seen the White House and the pushback that you're talking about. And I talked about it at, at some length on my show because I, I viewed that G7 incident as or that little moment as a Rorschach test where some people yeah. view it as a, a total smear of Biden. Other people say, no, look, he clearly wandered weirdly in a direction and they had to come get him. And then when they finally did get him, he's very slowly put on his sunglasses and then just stood there like he was rooted into the ground in this sort of awkward, uh, this awkward, stiff pose. I kind of to me, it's less about Biden and what he did. It was the body language and the obvious telegraphed concern of the other world leaders. They were like, something's a little off. We've got to bring him back over here. That, to me is what's worrisome because it looks like you have other dignitaries from other world powers saying the president of the United States needs some help here uh, or, you know, some yeah. sort of babysitting. And they can say it's totally out of context and completely unfair. Fine. They're saying the same thing about the Obama video in Los Angeles, where whatever you want to say about it, Obama goes back and grabs Biden by the forearm and then is like, come this way, and then puts his arm fully around him and walks him off stage. They can spin that and say it's nothing. I think taken together, a lot of people view it as something. And then how that plays out next Thursday over the course of two hours with someone who is not going to be eager to help Joe Biden in Donald Trump on the other side of the stage with a sustained period of questioning from from two of these CNN anchors. Um, all bets are off. I have no idea how it's going to go. Well, we will be watching and I want to talk more about their messages uh, on the other side of this break. So stick with us. We'll have more Reno on politics coming right up. We are back with Brino on politics. Guy, I want to get back to our discussion about the messages that we're seeing these two candidates put forward. You know, Trump is making a big play right now to try to sway minority voters. He is clearly making a Nevada play with the tax free tips, huge Hispanic population there. And then over the weekend, you saw him have this event at a Detroit uh, church, primarily black community there, talking about opportunity zones. Uh, investments in other sort of communities, low black unemployment numbers. And he called Biden the worst president for black people. The Biden campaign launched their own black voters for Biden Harris. Uh, you know, they've been touting the HBCUs, but the economy doesn't work for Biden when you're trying to make that play. And I just wonder how big of a disadvantage does Biden have being the incumbent you know, with, I think, the, a reality playing out where you've got the numbers looking better than they feel, but they feel bad for two different segments of the population. Like anyone who's younger than a millennial is dealing with the reality that you're you're likely not going to be able to own a home uh, unless you get significant help from your parents or, you know, you can, you can live for free for a while and save or some other form of help. Whereas if you are already a homeowner, um, and you you already, you know, you're, you're kind of balanced. It might not be affecting you quite as much. What do you see in terms of Trump's ability to pick off some traditionally Democratic supporters in mm. these two communities? Mm. Well, I think on the larger economic question, the homeownership and housing affordability problem is a big one. Also, just everything is too expensive. That is the biggest problem. You can point to some of the numbers that are good. Some of the numbers are great. Some of the numbers are shaky. Some of the numbers are lousy. There's a mixed picture on the economy. But what everyone feels, especially people who are not the richest of the rich, everything costs more. Overall, prices are up around 20 percent compared to what they were when Biden took office. That is the serious Achilles heel because mm -hmm. it affects everyone and it's painful. Right. And it's and it's been persistent. It's directly tied to their policies. They told us it wasn't going to happen and then it was going to be transitory. Ignore all the warnings. And then it's just been this, you know, tough sledding, in some cases, misery for years. Right. And, and it's still going in the wrong direction, albeit at a slightly slower pace, still the wrong direction. So that's the problem that Biden has with all of this economic messaging. Biden's other issue is Trump has a pretty easy turnkey message overall if he can stick to it 
and and have some discipline, which I know, you know, given the track record, who knows? But it's the classic Reagan line. Are you better off today than you were four years ago? And people then decided absolutely not. And they showed Jimmy Carter the door. I think if Trump can put a slight spin on it and say, are you better off today than you were five years ago? Because four years ago was crazy town, 2020, early COVID. No one knew what was going on. Uh, sort of the, the nutty riots and unrest. And we were in a bad place as a country. And a lot of that was you know, completely beyond anyone's control, especially on COVID. But if you just rewind the clock one extra year, so five years ago, 2019, I think 2019 Donald Trump gets reelected in 2020, absent some of these other huge factors, namely the pandemic. So I think if he kind of echoes Reagan and makes it five years rather than four, people can remember back. We might have short attention spans, but not that short. We remember how things kind of felt for our pocketbooks in the world in 2019 versus now. And I think it's a very tough uphill climb for Biden to make a compelling argument to voters. Yes, we are better now after the last three plus years of my leadership than we were before COVID and Trump. Voters don't believe that. Voters don't believe that yeah. if white, Hispanic, black, or, or anyone in between, which is why, look, Trump's not going to win the black vote. He might not even hit some of these big uh, sort of gaudy numbers that he and his supporters like to talk about. I think some of that's unrealistic. But Biden is absolutely dramatically underperforming. And yes, Trump is significantly overperforming, again, among black voters specifically. And I mean, just off the top of our heads, Jackie, we can just go through Atlanta, Georgia, Detroit, Michigan, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. These are heavily black cities. If Trump can do a little better and Biden does a little bit too moderately worse in any combination of those cities, let alone all four of them, that unto itself could be enough to swing the whole election over in Trump's direction. So I think there's a reason why there's real worry uh, within Democratic yeah. circles uh, about the demographic specifically that you asked about. Well, and I think to your point, you know, Biden's message is really geared toward the collective. Like if you had to guess, you know, or, or I guess if you had to sort of whittle down what his key message is, it's about democracy, right? It's about your rights being on the ballot. And, um, you know, even recently, even today, you know, they're, they're starting to lean in more on there was another Trump presidency. There could be more Supreme Court picks. I think outside of the issue of abortion that maybe people have more of a personal relationship with, um, it's really targeting the collective rather than the individual. And Trump's advantage there is to say, you know, look at your 401k, look at your savings, look at your, you know, your, look at your cost grocery of living. bill, look at your grocery bill, look at, look at the price of, you know, your, your rent, uh, you know, look at the wars, renting a car, the yeah, wars at least it, overseas. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think Trump comes out on top on that one too. Um, we'll be right back with more Prino on politics. We got more to talk about next. Jumping right back in, Guy, I know you're tight on time and we want to get to the viewer question um, because we always try to bring in the audience and, and see what questions they want you to answer. And one question that we got on Twitter uh, for you, Guy, to answer, if you were to look at who could bring in new Trump voters, who should he pick as his VP? Well, I think it's interesting. Trump has brought in a lot of new Republican voters himself, right? Non-traditional Republican voters. He's been very effective within a wide subset of the electorate. I think it's actually some traditional Republican voters who have strayed away from the party in recent years who are not big fans of Trump. That's an area where Trump needs to improve, where Trump needs to, I think, steady the ship and basically make an argument to these folks saying you might not Love me. In fact, you might actively dislike me, but you cannot stand Joe Biden. You don't want more of Biden and eventually probably, you know, Kamala Harris. Good chance uh, she she sees a different role at some point over the next four years. I think just, you know, demographically that that's a reasonable thought for people to have. You want to give those types of traditionalist, maybe sort of more moderate in some ways, Republican voters a sense of reassurance and a permission slip to say, okay, have never been super comfortable with Trump, but 
this other person's reasonable. I recognize that type of Republican. We probably should unify. We can't take four more years of this. I think that type of voter plus kind of the the suburban vote, certain certain women who have really abandoned Republicans it used to be, you know, leaning right voters who have gone to Team Blue or or very much toss up in recent cycles. You want to welcome them back into the fold. And I think doubling down on a MAGA type person might hurt in that pursuit. And uh, and I think, you know, Trump, Trump is going to drive primarily the turnout of MAGA world because he's their leader. They are going to crawl over broken glass for him, given everything that's gone on and has happened to him and Biden, the rest of it. I think it's, there's some balance that would behoove him on the ticket. And, you know, he obviously loves loyalty and he loves the MAGA thing, but he also wants to win. And I think that, you know, we've seen, I think in 2016, he made a calculation about what kind of person do I need to bring onto my ticket to shore up some of the issues that I might have. And he made that calculation and he picked Mike Pence, a guy that he may mm-hmm. not have like personally had a, a ton in common with someone who had, in fact, had endorsed Ted Cruz in the Indiana primary that year. He got over that stuff because he just felt I need this person from central casting who checks these boxes. And if Trump has a similar sense of the boxes he needs to check, as I just laid out, I think that will be reflected in his pick. And I think that would be smart. But I guess we'll see. I think he's going to keep us guessing probably all the way up to Milwaukee or awfully close. Well, it sounds like you're describing a Nikki Haley, but I don't see them mending that bridge. Maybe not I, her. I, maybe. I mean, it's maybe not someone, her. Someone who was like her on his shortlist, though, like who could be that person? Well, I'm not 100 percent sure of the shortlist. I'm not totally sold that the shortlist is the full list. The short list. Like there, yeah. there could be some misdirection there. I keep talking about some interesting people not being widely discussed, like Mike Pompeo. I could go through all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kim Reynolds is the governor of Iowa. I think there are some folks out there um, who would fit the bill in most, if not all of those ways. Um, but look, <laughs> I cannot get inside his head. Really, few people can. Um It's going to be his call. He has said he doesn't think it's really that important. I disagree. I think it is important. You have two candidates, 78 years old and older. People are going to be thinking about what might be next. And there's a lot of voters who I really think, Jackie, are on the brink of pulling the lever for Trump despite all sorts of misgivings. And a vice presidential pick could be a little push over the edge for him or it could be like, oh, hang on, I got to think about this harder. Um, okay. So I don't know how I feel about it, right? And and that's part of the dynamic at play here. In just the last 15 seconds, I know that we got to wrap here. What are we missing, Guy? What are you tracking this week? What are you going to be talking about on your show? Something I've been fixated on now for weeks. There was just a story in the New York Times about it. The best advantage that Joe Biden has is a Democratic Party that is obsessed with ballot operations and voting every way they possibly can. New York Times showed that among the likeliest voters who always participate, Biden is up by five points over Donald Trump. Among unlikely participants or people who haven't voted at all in the last couple of elections, Trump is up by 14 points in that same poll. Mm. Can Trump and the Republicans turn out enough of the sometimes to almost never voters to overwhelm the guaranteed tsunami of disciplined voting that the Democrats will facilitate. So there's a systemic advantage for the Democrats and Biden among the base and the way that they absolutely will participate. These high propensity voters, the low propensity voters will make or break Trump's campaign. We are going to be watching that closely. And you're always so great to talk to about these kinds of issues guy love having you back on the podcast love listening to you and hope to talk to you again soon oh thanks for having me and congrats on your big promotion we're thrilled for you well deserved listen ad free with a fox news podcast plus subscription on apple Podcasts, and amazon prime members can listen to this show ad free on the amazon music app